Transnationalism is uh, primarily a state of mind. There is a greater sense of transnationalism, that there is a certain ability to think beyond just being in one place. To be transnational is to be from more than one place. For immigrants, the initial journey may take them by air, by sea, by railway, or by highway. But it begins with imagination. They don't see a zero-sum relationship between wanting to be American and continuing to be or wanting to be as Vietnamese or Indian as they were. And there's something in the new technology that is making the experience for immigrants different. It would be very hard now, these days, without um, internet, without Skype, without Facebook, without um, all of these things that we are using on a daily basis. I feel like I'm at home, and I feel like I'm connected, and I feel like uh, I'm not lost. Changes in global communication now mean people can immigrate to a mid-sized American city like Grand Rapids, Michigan, and remain connected to their homelands. It is theoretically possible now to be the only person from someplace somewhere and still have a very close group support because of the vast ways that one can do this. I don't feel lonely. First, I'm living with my relatives. And second, I can talk to my parents back home whenever I like. But there can be hard adjustments. Yeah, West Michigan is very cold for me. I don't like snow at all and technology may have its limits. For many, a local sense of community is vital. Because when you are in a situation where you are not communicating with others, part of you starts to die. This is a story of how fast changes in global communication are altering the immigrant experience, seen through the eyes of people who made a new home in Grand Rapids. They express the challenges, joys, and frustrations of existing in two worlds. The fact that they may make homes here and all is deeply affected by the fact they also left homes or situations. But there's a sense of being from somewhere else. For some, the trip to Grand Rapids, Michigan is not a story of immigration. It's not a life journey that landed in this Midwestern city of nearly 190,000 people. Rather, it's simply about taking part in an annual cultural event. This is Art Prize. Part fair and part competition, Art Prize is an annual fall festival where thousands of residents and visitors vote on public art they like the most. That includes paintings, sculptures, even performance pieces. There is, to some extent, a noticeable uniformity in the crowd. Largely, the faces are white, a reflection of the history of Western Michigan. Jerry Johnson is a sociologist at Grand Valley State University and studies changing demographics. I think it is an accurate uh, perception that the Grand Rapids has historically been a very white, conservative, uh, Dutch reform community. That's how uh, a big enclave, sort of like we're talking about a century ago, of people from Holland landed here and they really got a foothold uh, in Grand Rapids. The Dutch reform group has really has has really become, I think, the most powerful group in business and in and in, in, in anything related to how the norms and values and culture of Grand Rapids. And they've sort of that group has been has dominated sort of the landscape more than any other group. But Johnson is quick to point out what the public can't see quite so easily on a visit to Art Prize. Beyond downtown, in pockets across the greater Grand Rapids area, there are new faces altering the landscape. In terms of the changes over the last 20 years or so, I, the Census Bureau hasn't really begun to pick up all the varying groups that have come into Grand Rapids beyond sort of the big ones, which is Latino, Hispanic, and African American. But I think over time, what we've seen is, is that the percentage of non-whites, the people of non-whites has gone up quite a bit if we take them all together. Johnson and others believe Grand Rapids is not unusual. Experts say even in places that have been relatively homogenous for a long time, 
it has become somewhat easier to be a newcomer. A globalization, mobility, transnationalism has enabled this kind of uh, mobility. Kareem H. Kareem is a journalism professor at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. He is among scholars who speak about what it means to be transnational, the idea that people not only move physically from one country to another, but also maintain a psychological presence in both the place they came from and the place they came to. So it may be perhaps a, a, a select few or a very small proportion of the world, which is transnational, uh, but it is a, a group which is, uh, I think, significant. Uh, it includes people who, are, who have migrated. It also includes people who go for work assignments. Uh, it includes people who are uh, the jet setters and so on. They, they are the people, the, the individuals, the human beings who connect countries through constant travel, through constant interaction and communication. In other words, American cities like Grand Rapids are making room for immigrants whose lives are straddled across national borders. Their families, friends, and sometimes even their co-workers are often dispersed. But they're now able to maintain daily contact. The way you can communicate, send pictures, text messages, of course, uh, audio, etc. All these ways uh, that you're using just a cell phone, how you can connect to various computers, uh, websites, etc., which has made things remarkably easier for uh, a large number of people. Community has less to do with where you are. It's now not a location thing. It's an available availability of technology thing. Some experts believe what's happening in places like Grand Rapids has as much to do with changing American culture as it does with changing technology. Arjun Apadurai is an anthropologist who studies media and culture at New York University. He believes the U.S. is becoming less of a melting pot and more culturally hybrid, where immigrants have greater freedom to carry more than one identity at the same time. They don't see a zero-sum relationship between wanting to be American and continuing to be or wanting to be as Vietnamese or Indian as they were. So this is already one interesting question, that this country is something in the cultural milieu that allows you to imagine that that's okay. Mm -hmm. you know, obviously there are issues, racism and so on and so forth, or moments where there are tensions about this or that part of the world, and then it projects onto the local community. But generally speaking, unlike, say, France, there's a strong pressure to just become French. In the U.S., there's more room for hyphenation. Apadurai writes about what he calls imagined worlds. The idea that people can simply imagine the possibility of leaving their homeland and living somewhere else. International media, he argues, fuels that imagination. One factor in all of this is the rise of ethnic media, like this Chinese TV drama. It's made in China, but accessible via satellite to Chinese immigrants across the globe. There's also what's called diasporic media, foreign language content created in the places where immigrants have arrived. Spanish language networks like Univision, for example, are headquartered in the U.S. The channel broadcasts to Americans, but reaches an international audience as well. You have different manifestations of what's happening. You have uh, certain ethnic media which may be completely devoted to the old country, others which are very much engaged with the society uh, where people are living, and others, mostly diasporic media, which are also engaged with the, with the old country. Kareem Kareem acknowledges this kind of heritage media is comforting, but he believes all these high-tech connections can stall or even prevent some healthy assimilation. And if one only looks at homeland media, then you might as well not have moved from the old home country because you've isolated yourself in this bubble. What is the point of moving? So, uh, and and it, you're basically hurting yourself by not exposing yourself, by not uh, 
looking at a variety of, of stimuli and, and educational experiences and cultural experiences that uh, the new society has to offer. In Grand Rapids, some communities are engaged in what's known as cultural reproduction. That means they often replicate religious and ethnic institutions and create a social structure similar to the one they left behind. For sociologists like Jerry Johnson, the question is will these communities remain as enclaves and close themselves off, or will they become more connected to the mainstream? True multiculturalism doesn't allow for single group uh, domination because true multiculturalism, this inclusiveness that we're talking about, starts to want, fo starts to in over time mean that more diverse voices are at the table, right? So that it becomes more difficult to just say, we're a Republican conservative Dutch community. That narrative has to change over time. Our story now moves from the more familiar faces that have defined Grand Rapids to the less familiar ones that may define it in the future. These are the individual stories of some fairly new and not so new immigrants who've made a home here. So we would plan some uh, hot chili. There is Tan Tran, a young woman from Vietnam who is living with her grandparents and starting a life after going to college here. Sarah Pro Año is from Venezuela and Ecuador and is making the transition from a life where she couldn't afford media technology to one where she can. For some, the transition has been centered on upward mobility. Suresh and Alka Bargava have been in the U.S. for more than 20 years and blend their past from India with their present life. Almir and Amina Aliskovic are from Bosnia. Both escaped the war, but their unique post-war experiences left them with different emotions about staying in America. I lived in a refugee camp for, for 13 years. Zachariah uh, Juk Shar and Malau Mike Tan are refugees from the Sudan. Both have found community here, and both feel a sense of duty to return to their homeland and rebuild. Su Yi has found a small world of Chinese friends here in Grand Rapids, adds some technology and media, and he has what, for him, may be the best of both worlds. Together, these distinct personal stories paint a picture of a changing Grand Rapids and show different aspects of what it means to be from somewhere else. In her kitchen, Amina Aliskovic pours crepe batter into a pan while her husband Almir sits nearby surfing the net. The Aliskoviches escaped the war in their homeland, Bosnia, to create a new life here. Bosnian music from the internet fills the air, but what's on the stove may be the strongest connection to home. We cook Bosnian food. Um, we can't live without that. <laughs> Almir and Amina live in the suburbs, raising their two young sons, six-year-old Benjamin and five-year-old Sonia. Mom, I'm not sure what's... They met in the U.S. and are now American citizens. Culturally, they share a lot of common ground, but they have some differences, largely because of what happened after the war. I was born in Focha, um, and I moved to Sarajevo, where I grew up... Um, I moved to Sarajevo because of the war uh, in 1992. I wasn't born in a town called Priedor. Um, my family fled 1992 to Germany. Um, and uh, we lived there for about eight years. And um, after the war, uh, my family um, had to leave Germany. And um, we decided to, move, to immigrate to the United States. Those different journeys, Amina stayed in Bosnia much longer, led to different emotions about the past. I think that he just doesn't have that feeling um, for Bosnia as I have or some of the people who moved um, to the United States when they were, you know, 18, 19 years old. Younger kids, you know, younger generations, 
they don't they didn't live there they didn't have friends there they didn't go to school they they don't have family like immediate family you know mm -hmm. so he doesn't have to go to bosnia versus me where i have to go like there's yeah, no because you have more friends there than i do and it's my family your family is down, down, down there, there where my family is spread all over the world Almir's parents eventually moved from the U.S. to Belgium, but Amina's family returned to post-war Bosnia. So now, the cost of travel and the lack of regular face-to-face -face contact have left Amina and Elmir too with a sense of loss. The feeling that you have in, in Bosnia, you could never have here. I mean, you can have all these things, a house and job and career, but the love and the, the feeling, you, you, you don't have that here. And why? Because the family, they, they're, not, they're not around. I know I could enjoy this life that I have here a lot better if, if our family members would be around. Bear in mind they are not alone here. Since 1992, the State Department helped settle more than 130,000 Bosnians in the U.S. Roughly 8,000 Bosnians came to West Michigan through the help of refugee agencies. That's why in Grand Rapids, Amina and Almir can go shopping at a Bosnian market and connect with Bosnian friends and community. It is, of course, not the same as moving back, but it helps make them feel more at home because Amina and Almir say they're in the U.S. to stay. I know if I would just move back to Bosnia, it would be very hard for me because it would be like a new environment for me, a um, new uh, generation. Uh, you don't know people and uh, I mean I speak I still speak the language but it would be hard for me to get back that life choice however is not just about career and their lives it's also about their children the first thing I'm thinking about is my kids right now yes. so have to think about their future too I know that they have better future here that they could do a lot more right now, at least how it is right now, that they could do a lot more here than down there. <laughs> With that decision, modern media has played an important role. Elmira and Amina sit with the boys watching Make Way for Nadi, a British children's series here dubbed in Bosnian. <laughs> For these parents, teaching the native language is critical. They are also big multimedia users. Sports, I mean, everything is right there, politics, science, health. Everything from phone contact with family to Bosnian movies on YouTube. The media is really important for me. Um, it would be very hard now, these days, without um, internet, without Skype, without Facebook, without um, all of these things that we are using on a daily basis. That helps, but it doesn't solve a dilemma. To be sure, new media is a marvelous bridge to the old world. But particularly for Amina, it can neither resolve an identity crisis nor remove a sadness of being apart from a place she loves. Uh, you feel disconnected because you can't go and even though you're watching pictures or talking on the Skype or talking on the phone, you wish you can go down there and just like sit with somebody and have coffee with your favorite friend or your, your mom and your dad. So sometimes you feel disconnected because you can't do that. You can't just buy a ticket and go over there. Um, I mean, you could if you would have a lot of money, but, um, you know, on an everyday life, you can't do that. Or if something is happening down there, for example, birthdays, um, um, anniversaries, um, holidays, I feel bad when it comes to that because I can't go um, and be with my family. So it feels disconnected sometimes. That disconnect is part of the trade-off. They use all the tools to be connected in the country they chose but that cannot be a replacement for the country they left.
I was born in uh, Vietnam in 1985, and I grew up there. I just moved here three years ago. Tan Tran is a young woman who, in many ways, lives a life in between, one that straddles language, culture, and generations. <laughs> At her home in Grand Rapids, Tan lives with her grandparents, Hao Mai and Day Tron. They chat in Vietnamese as they tend the garden together. Her two young cousins are also part of the household, and with them, she speaks English. The blending of different ages and tongues is all part of the family fabric. My grandparents have 10 kids, and four of the children came with them when they first migrated from Vietnam to the U.S. 19 years ago. And then they sponsored for other families to come over. So uh, now there are seven families of my uncles and aunts who are living in Grand Rapids. And my own parents and two of my uncles are still living in Vietnam. Tan's family reflects a larger picture. Since the war in Vietnam, the U.S. became a destination. About 1.1 million Vietnamese migrated to America, making them the fifth largest group of immigrants in the States. Many, like Tan, came for economic reasons or simply to better themselves. Tan got a degree in marketing at Grand Valley State University. Tan says she chose Grand Valley because the tuition was affordable and she had a place to stay with her grandparents. Tan is also, in a way, between religions. Her grandparents are Buddhists, and at times, she accompanies them to the local temple. But her mother is Catholic, and Tan also goes to church. However, Tan is comfortable with a hybrid, a national identity influenced by an exposure to American media. So I grew up in Vietnam, so I am Vietnamese, and the way I feel, the way I react to things are still typically Vietnamese, but um, I think I, I use more American media now that I'm living here. And Tan uses that media a lot. Websites like National Geographic and USA Today are common stops for her online. She also pops on to Do E Tre E, a Vietnamese news page that she says feels like an American website. Online, Tan is entirely comfortable going back and forth between languages and formats. On Facebook, she connects in both Vietnamese and English. The way we type Vietnamese letters on casual media like Facebook is very different from the official Vietnamese language that you learn at school. And the young people invented some kind of language that maybe my uh, grandparents can have a hard time understanding. In fact, her grandparents exist in a distinctly different media landscape. In her bedroom, Hao watches SBTN, the Saigon Broadcasting Television Network, where she enjoys movies and absorbs politics. Yes, she says, there is some American TV in her life. Like the Oscars, Miss America, or the Grammys, she says. But mostly, the family can now, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, choose to stay in a Vietnamese media microcosm with television, DVDs, even magazines. So for older people, they may be settled in the world of Vietnamese media because it's harder for them to learn English and use um, American media. Representative. But for younger people like me and my cousins, um, it's not only about um, using it as a tool to get, uh, get in life, but um, it's about the joy of learning a culture through the language. And um, you are living here, you deal with American people, so it makes sense to, to use American media. For this family, so many options have changed. It's now no great burden to afford the internet or regular cell phone calls to Vietnam. But Day remembers how it used to be. 
tiếp xúc với người Mỹ nhiều thì chúng tôi cũng là. When we came here almost 20 years ago, he says, there were not many Vietnamese channels to watch or Vietnamese newspapers to read. But we were lucky to work in a factory where there were a lot of Vietnamese people, so we could enjoy chatting in Vietnamese with them. For her part, Tan really does not act as though she is in between or in some way displaced. Rather, she acts like she belongs. Her ability to connect with loved ones back in Vietnam on a daily basis makes her feel confident and supported. Perhaps ironically, it has also made it easier to see the possibility of a distinct, enriching life in America. So like my grandparents, when they moved here 19 years ago, the technology was not the same, and it cost a lot to call home, so they, can't get to call, they couldn't get to call very often. We only heard from them every month or even months. <laughs> so, so um, but now I'm luckier that um, I have more choices, cheaper choices, to connect um, to people in Vietnam. Um, that makes me feel very good. Now, I don't feel lonely. Enter this kitchen in the suburbs of Grand Rapids and you will find two excellent cooks, often quibbling over the right way to get things done. The cuisine and language bring alive the sounds and senses of India. This is the music of this music in my kitchen, all utensils, you know. This is the home of Alka and Suresh Bhargava. As with many immigrants, their lives and customs are a mixture of the old and the new. Usually means most of the time we speak in Hindi. When we are mad at each other, we start yelling at each other in English. So English is our yelling language and Hindi is our telling language. Okay. <laughs> Truth is, the Bhargavas blend their backgrounds a lot more than that. By the different... When they watch TV news from India, they love to discuss issues in a mixed tongue they call English. It is a reflection on the other side of the state, so anything mm -hmm. could happen. So Modi ko Gujarat mein jante hain. Modi is just Gujarat. Modi is not India. They have been at this for a long time. It was back in 1992 when Suresh, sponsored by his older brothers, came from Jaipur, India, and established himself at a Michigan power company. Alka soon followed. They became American citizens, raising their two daughters in America. They came for opportunity, but maintained a strong ethnic consciousness and see themselves as both Indian and American. We are basically uh, contributing to the American culture of melting pot, you know. Our son-in-law is a Caucasian son-in-law. So, yes, we are kind of blending into the fabric of American culture. Their trajectory was part of an international trend. Since 1960, the Indian immigrant population in the U.S. has grown to over 150 times its size, nearly 2 million people. Many came with the English language and education. Alka began a career in banking and then, with help from her husband, went into business. Thank you. You're welcome. Eventually opening two liquor stores in the Grand Rapids area. I managed both of them and then we had 10 employees in both the stores. So. I'm just here and there all day long, but after four I come back home to make sure my house is put together, my husband gets taken care of well. In many ways, from the art in their home to the media they follow, the Bargavas give off a sense of where they're from and where they are now. When it comes to news, they take in a range of content. You see a lot of stuff that's happening on that side of the fence which is not reported over here. The Indian, Indian media rip, gives us a lot of insight into that. Uh, I, I go into the media on internet on that side. Or we stay connected with the Indian news on the dish network that we get. That's another. Chin mein 
They know, for example, details about regional Indian political races and talk at length about what's happening on the national scene. Just about every day, they watch Indian newscasts via satellite and read several Indian websites. But in a sense, their news interests have immigrated too. Since we live here, we are a part of this society, so I want to know more about here too. So CNN, New York Times, and Today Show, like that basically starts, you know, our uh, day. Our morning. Morning, yeah. yeah. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to Today on a Friday morning. However, when it comes to entertainment, Alka and Suresh lean toward Bollywood. <laughs> There are a couple of opera, soap operas that we watch, and I like one in particular, which is a mythological. The language spoken is so pure and so beautiful, Sanskritized, that it gives us an opportunity to hear that, learn from it, adapt it in our uh, daily life. But it's not enough just to watch. There's a wealth of content about Bollywood online. Uh, if I go on the Indian sites, I would prefer to watch uh, the reviews about the Indian movies, which one is the most current one, what kind of rating they got, which one is good, who is the director of it. The Bhargavas have non-Indian friends and are very comfortable with American culture. At the same time, they hold on to their ethnic identity with passion. Sorry, Look at the jealous. workmanship. Here, it's all intricated. Alka is happy to show her collection of saris, traditional Indian dresses. So I'm proud of my heritage, I'm proud of my culture. Of course we are here, but we, as long as I'm alive or as long as I have energy, I definitely would like to dress up who I am, at least in my community events, you know. Suresh and Alka use technology, Facebook, email, cell phone. Okay, love you a lot. To stay in close contact with family in India. But unlike some who came to America to escape hardship, the Bhargavas did not. They came to advance. Their diasporic experience is not about dislocation or longing for their homeland. Rather, they are integrated, maintaining an Indian identity while fully merged in the economic life of the U.S. But what they can't know is how much of their culture will pass on to their next generation in America. And as Indians, we would like to preserve that particular key element. Uh, I don't know how, how successful we would be, but we are trying. This is a Friday night tradition. A group of guys who play basketball just about every week and they have more in common than just the love of the game. They all live in the Grand Rapids area and they all emigrated here from China. I like how friends and the way we have the same backgrounds and we have the same type of sports interests. We like play the same kind of games. Su Yi is a computer engineer who says one reason he enjoys his life in the U.S. so much is because he has such good Chinese friends in his community. Chinese community here very special because we are very close. Uh, we help each other. We, you know, get together a lot. Su and many of his teammates have been in America for some time. Su came in 1998 to attend graduate school at Notre Dame. He now lives with his wife and two children in Ada, a Grand Rapids suburb. To be sure, waves of Chinese immigration to the U.S. stem back to the mid-19th century, the railroads, the gold rush. But the modern rush is focused on economic opportunity, with more than 700,000 Chinese getting green cards from 2000 to 2010. During his life, Su has experienced an economic transformation. Ma my family, my brothers, sisters, you know, uh, yeah, we were from a small town. We were poor. You know, everybody was poor at, at that time. But um, my parents, uh, they, they work very hard, and they gave us very good uh, uh, education. So all, all um, three uh, brothers and one sister, we all went to Beijing for a very good uh, colleges. 
So that, that's why we're all in Beijing. Uh, they're all in Beijing right now. You know, they all have a good job, all have a very good business uh, right now. Now he says he is living the life he wants, a life connected to his Chinese background, but permanently rooted in America. Life here is very uh, simple, peaceful. Um, yeah, but in China right now, because it's doing this economy development very fast, so people are very busy. You, when you go on to streets, you see a lot of people walking faster, get around the su subway, it's packed by p p people. So uh, when I go, go, back, go back to China, I say, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's so different. Uh, I kind of like, m more like love here. It's uh, easier. It's Su's connections to his Chinese heritage are aided by some cool media technology. This is WeChat, a phone app that translates Chinese characters drawn by finger into text messages. It's very, very pop popular right now in the Ch Chinese community globally. It's not just in the States or in the China. In every other country, there are other Chinese there. People use WeChat. Along with WeChat, there's iTalk. It's an internet-based television network that gives Su and his family a wide range of entertainment programs from China. Some of the content embeds messages of the Chinese government, which is pushing to move the population from rural areas to urban centers. Thus, a light family drama is clothed with hip styles and the idea of the good life in the modern city. No doubt, modern communication makes it easier for Su to live in the land he chose and stay attached to the one he left. He speaks to his parents weekly and uses social media to stay connected. However, what ultimately makes an American life livable for Sue and Grand Rapids is mostly not technology. It's people. The local Chinese community has given Sue a sense of belonging. Through the local Chinese association, Su has not only found friends for playing basketball, his daughter goes weekly to a Chinese school which teaches language and culture. I want my daughter to be there because I want them to know two languages so then they can learn different perspectives uh, in viewing things. My family is also in China, my parents, my brothers, and she, when she goes back to China, I want to you know, talk in Chinese so they can build the connections relationships. Ultimately, Sue lives a transnational existence aided by high tech, but supported by his immediate family and his local friends. For him, the balance is almost perfect, except for one thing, he misses the food. There is a saying, it's interesting, you might want to know. No, no. <laughs> I, I, I'll speak in Chinese first. It means I don't have the heart, but I have the stomach. So it means, you know, uh, since you're staying here, you want to live here, live life here. You, 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 you prefer to live here, but you don't like the food here. You prefer food there. So uh, it doesn't mean I go back to China just to eat the food, but uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a big attraction. Inside the offices of the Hispanic Center of Western Michigan, a member of the staff is calling her family. Se ve muy oscuro. Oh, ahí está mejor. Es una entrevista. Hola, papi, ¿cómo estás? Bien, bien, bien. ¿Tú qué tal? Sarah Pro Año uses her iPad to Skype with her father and brother. Aquí te pasa, Davi. Que Dios te bendiga, Sarita. Gracias, papi. Dios te bendiga. Chao, chao. There in Quito, Ecuador, she's in Grand Rapids. He's struggling to, to finish his thesis and, and graduate in, uh, ¿cómo se llama tu título, Vivi? What's, what's the name? Sonido, sonidista. In, in, in sound. He's struggling to, to graduate in sound, so he's working in his thesis now. This kind of connection is part of Sarah's everyday life. I wouldn't have survived, and I'm talking literally, <laughs> if I didn't have strong connections of people that were investing in my life, 
back in South America and in here. In fact, Sarah says she almost didn't survive, at least emotionally. She grew up in Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. In 2006, she came to America and became part of a massive population shift, one of nearly 50 million people of Hispanic origin now living in the United States. In Grand Rapids, that translates to about 16% of the population, approximately 30,000 people. Sarah came to the U.S. for marriage. While I was in the marriage, there was uh, some economic issues. We didn't have a lot of money, and uh, there was access to the internet was limited. The connection was very poor, and we had only one computer. Sarah and her husband divorced. She now has two young children. Sarah is acutely aware of her dislocation, and the lack of communication with her family in Ecuador and Venezuela made her feel isolated. I basically died for them, all of them. You know, I was uh, away, and nobody knew any, anything about me except when they call. And even when they called, there were times of the day and night where my ex-husband would not like me answering the phone. So I knew it was my parents, but I wouldn't answer because he was, he was going to get upset or the baby was sleeping. Or, and it was very difficult. I slowly forgot who I was. Things changed in her personal life and her diasporic experience altered too. Sarah is working at the Hispanic Center and has access to all kinds of media and communication tools. Now her connection to family and the communities she left behind are part of her everyday experience in Grand Rapids. Hola, Sari, ¿cómo vas? Yet Sarah has also built something new. She lives with a hybrid identity, belonging to her heritage, but also part of the country and community where she is raising her children. If you don't have those relationships, those meaningful relationships anymore, if you don't have a way to get connected with your family that you left over there, you committed social suicide in your country, you left, and then now you're here, you either find a way to communicate with them or you create new meaningful relationships here. And things that we believe, you know. Sarah says she is doing just that on communicating with loved ones in South America and building new social networks in Michigan. We are a globalized world. We are able to communicate in ways that we were never able to communicate. Here at a conference, Sarah speaks to professionals about immigration and domestic violence. But as linked in as she is here, she does a lot to keep tabs on life in South America. Sarah tends to follow national and international news stories, and that, says Martha Gonzalez Cortez of the Hispanic Center of Western Michigan, is part of a trend. Gonzalez Cortez says, although there are a number of Spanish language magazines and papers in the Grand Rapids area, most are weekly or monthly. In other words, for Hispanics in smaller American cities, there often isn't much Spanish language news in real time. And um, you can't live your life successfully being completely disconnected um, from every news source on the planet. Um, and so again, that's forced this community to go in the direction of the cable providers and the satellite television or satellite radio that will um, give you some access to news in Spanish. What you're missing is the information about what's happening in your own community. For Sarah Pro Año, the community connection is all important, but for her, it can't all come through online media or phone calls or Skype. She is learning to appreciate the balance of being from somewhere else. La harina de, para hacer arepas. That online and phone communication with her loved ones from South America cannot replace the human connections she's making in Grand Rapids. And I, I believe that I am doing both. I have very meaningful relationships back in my countries. But I do have extremely meaningful and supportive relationships here as well. But I have to reinvent myself. I had to change the way I, th I think.
The minister for this Sunday church service is speaking in his native tongue, Dinka, one of the tribal languages from South Sudan. <laughs> Zachariah Jukshar is a spiritual leader at an Episcopal congregation in Grand Rapids. He exudes a calm demeanor. But his congregants are aware of his painful past. Zachariah is known as a lost boy, one of thousands of African refugees separated from their families by civil war between North and South Sudan. And when I came to the United States, uh, being sponsored by the United Nations uh, in the age of 19, and uh, arrived in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in January 31, uh, 2001, uh, and I was being sponsored by an agency called Lutheran Social Services. In fact, many of the Sudanese who make up the 1,000 or so families in the Grand Rapids area are here because of refugee resettlement programs. And nationwide, Africans represent one of the largest immigrant groups coming to the U.S., numbers that have multiplied 10 times since the 1980s. When he arrived, Zachariah was a striver, working in a meat processing plant while he went to school to become an ordained minister. He and his wife Tabitha settled in Grand Rapids, raising their two young sons. But Zachariah longed for his native family, and because of chaos in the war's aftermath, for 10 years, Zachariah wasn't sure if his immediate relatives had survived. Uh, when I went back in South Sudan in 2011, you know, going back to look, uh, to see where my parents are. And after that, I found that, you know, none of them are alive. So all of them have been died. Uh, my dad was been killed in the war. My two brothers was been killed in the war. My mom was been died of malaria, uh, including my sister, except uh, my younger brother. He's the only one that whom I met, uh, plus uh, some of my uncles uh, who are alive and some other extended family. In this community, stories like Zachariah's are not uncommon. My name is uh, Malau Mike Ton. Malau Mike Ton was also a lost boy and also lives in Grand Rapids. His search for his past turned out differently. When the civil war broke out in Sudan, and then there was a fighting, gun fighting, and then I and other thousand of lost boys, as old boys, we flew the war. I mean, we escaped the war from Sudan to Ethiopia. Christian missionaries helped Malau come to Michigan, too. But after years of disconnect, Malau discovered that many of his relatives, including his parents, were alive. And now he speaks to them regularly by phone. But given the remoteness of his home village, it's not simple. While his mother now has a cell phone... She don't know how to use it. And if I call, she have to call somebody to come and answer it, and then somebody have to make sure that she's talking to me. So for one man, communication to family is a reconnect of what he left behind, and to another, it is, in a sense, a reminder of what he lost. Still, both remain committed to their heritage. Zachariah uses a variety of media to connect with remaining family. He's also forming his own relief organization to make a difference in his native village. Now, uh, as I form an organization that I would like to support uh, my family, um, especially my village of Duke Padiet, uh, forming an organization that I will be delivering medicine, uh, you know, because this village has you know, been gone with no medicine since uh, during the war. Malau is also helping supporting a school and education in his village. Both men share a deep cultural desire to teach Dinka, so their children will be able to communicate, both remotely and in person, to family in South Sudan. Since I came to this country, I feel both, uh, you know, American and the Sudanese, both. And the reason why I feel both is uh, because I still have a connection with my community, so I feel both, you know, because I'm practicing both cultures. That's not always easy, and there are fears. Malau wants his children to benefit from America's safety and opportunities, 
but there are limits to how much change he can tolerate. If I want them to be more American, they're going to think that they are free. And then they don't listen to me, and then they move out in the house, and then I don't know what they're doing. So I want to keep them close to me, and I want to be Sudanese. To be a Dinka girl means something. To be a Dinka boy means something. It means a lot. The landscape is changing because the mediascape has changed so much. With the ever-broadening reach of global communication, immigrants may already have a sense of their future home before they arrive. I have absolutely no doubt that anybody who comes to the U.S. today comes with a richer picture uh, of what might, could, or should happen when they get to the U.S. than they did before. And when they arrive, they can stay plugged into the land they left. Technology connects and has created more possibilities of belonging to both countries. There are ways in which we have built our lives in Grand Rapids and improved the quality of life for our families by, being, by remaining transnationally connected. And um, people have found different ways to do that. But the adjustments can be complex and varied. Those who came for economic opportunity may have an easier time, while those who escaped poverty and war may find it harder to live between two worlds. Further, the land they left may have changed so much that going back is not an easy option. In the stories of Tan, Sarah, Zachariah, Malau, Sue, Alka and Suresh, and Amina and Almir, there is indeed a sense of pride that they have adapted, all using the tools of their times to stay in touch with their past as they move toward the future. But there is also a cautionary tale. Technology has its limits, and that to be truly transnational, one has to find community, something a cell phone or video call cannot always provide. So even though the media have enabled us tremendously to, to enhance the connections that we have uh, with our family and with our loved ones and people from our cultural background, there still remains a human need uh, to connect uh, at a person-to-person -person level. And there remains an essential question. How will all these changes change us? If a city like Grand Rapids, once more homogenous, becomes more diversified, how will it evolve? I think the city itself is on this inevitable shift towards a, a real different place. It's, it's going to be interesting to follow the dynamics going forward. Communication technology has redefined the journey. There are more ways to connect back home. As that revolution continues, and more people take on a broader cultural and geographical identity, more of us may understand what it means to be from somewhere else. Thank you.